Where can veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder get help for themselves and their families? And Colleen Merlot joins us to discuss mental illness awareness and efforts to combat stigma. Well, you know, because of some of the tragic events that have taken place in our country, people have been talking about mental illness, but a lot of what they are saying is not based in fact. And we revisit the segment on the Response Hotline. Hello, I'm Art Flesher from Suffolk County Health Department's Division of Community Mental Hygiene. I'm your host for Something of Substance, a monthly video magazine. Welcome back. Each month we show how substance abuse, mental illness, and developmental delays affect you, your kids, and your community. We'll also give you a few examples of how services in Suffolk County help people find the inner resources they need to tackle their problems. Where's mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. Soldiers who have served in combat often experience difficulty readjusting to civilian life. The psychological effects of their military experience often have a lingering and detrimental impact on all aspects of their lives. We spoke to some experts and veterans who shared their knowledge on this mental health concern. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a, uh, a disease that's been around since the beginning of time. I mean, it was first diagnosed back in Sparta. It's been around since World War II, World War I, Korea, uh, Vietnam, and now with Iraq and Afghanistan. It's that, that switch inside of our body that tells you to either fight or run. But the problem with PTSD is, is that it's not a switch. It doesn't turn off. So when we're in combat, such as myself, when we're faced with these scenarios that we're not used to being on the home front, being safe, then we have to react. We have a startle response. So if we react, now are we gonna fight or are we gonna run? And that's part of being a soldier, is knowing when to fight, when to run, and make these decisions. Now that we come home, it's not a light switch. It doesn't turn off. Now we still continue with these same symptoms. Uh, it's characterized by individuals reliving the traumatic event, uh, trying to avoid any type of situation that reminds them of the traumatic event, and then having a symptoms of hyperarousal, where they have a startle response. They're always on edge. They have panic attacks. Coming back from overseas, the hard part to getting back and acclimating yourself back into the the public uh, arena, as you would say, is uh, I was always hypervigilant. I had nothing in common with my friends anymore. When I came home, I went into a house out in Rocky Point on the island with four other veterans, two Marines, two Army guys, back to college. My family thought I did LSD. I had changed so much, so dramatically. Uh, many of the combat veterans, when they come in home, have to deal with issues, not only with what they dealt with in combat, but with family dynamics, and that's a big factor in a, in a veteran healing. Uh, well, when I came back from Iraq, I decided to leave the military, and I think I kind of had a similar experience that a lot of veterans have. It's sort of two challenges. There's just the reintegration uh, challenge of kind of learning to become a civilian again. Um, but then I also was struggling with what I didn't realize at the time was post-operational stress. During a PTSD event, uh, 4th of July is a perfect example. A lot of fireworks going off. It reminds people of the sounds of battle. Uh, they relive the event. I IED explosions in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. They want to avoid situations. They're traveling down the road. They're going under an overpass. Uh, the hyperarousals there, the uh, sense of awareness trying to avoid the overpass. Is there going to be a bomb? Is there going to be something under it? the uh, chemicals that are dumped into your body for the panic attack. And I had a high startle response, so any unexpected noises uh, resulted in a, you know, really bone rattling and sickening kind of reaction. 
Um, I had uh, different mood swings. Um, I did have uh, a lot of intrusive thoughts that, um, and memories about uh, things that had happened to me when I was over there um, that just really were interfering with my um, reintegration home and my wellness. I used to have horrible nightmares at night of all these visions of killing people and I called it sleeping with the devil, living on the dark side. But once I got sober, that stopped. It was really three years after um, I came back before I even recognized that I was suffering from having served in Iraq. And I even asked myself that question, like, wow, maybe I'm, maybe I'm hurting right now because of Iraq. One of the problems when we come home from combat, men are not born not to see the horror and damage that we inflict in war. And it changes us so much, we give our family PTSD, especially our wife and children. The Babylon Vet Center deals with war trauma, and we deal with uh, issues of readjustment, as well as military sexual trauma, bereavement. Uh, we have couples counseling, we have partners group, we do individual therapy, and we also have uh, group therapy as well. The Veterans Health Alliance of Long Island is a collaborative effort of about 80 different organizations, including the VA here at uh, Northport, uh, county and state uh, mental health departments, uh, drug and alcohol providers, mental health providers, um, as well as local universities. And our mission is to promote the health and well-being of Long Island veterans and their families through advocacy and a broad array of services. Soldiers find out about the Babylon Vet Center through numerous outreach events that we attend in the community as well as referrals from the VA and other organizations that assist uh, veterans, such as the Soldiers Project and other community organizations. The Soldiers Project is uh, an organization, it's a group of volunteer social workers, doctors, a psychotherapist, family counselors that provide free, confidential psychological counseling for the vets who are returning from Iraq and Afghanistan and their families. The treatment protocol that we use here at the VA is real evidence-based treatment. We do a lot of prolonged exposure, uh, which is uh, kind of reliving the event, doing relaxation techniques to help deal with the feelings that come up. There's cognitive processing therapy that we use. We use a lot of yoga, guided imagery. Uh, yoga has become a evidence-based treatment for PTSD. Uh, there's a lot of group therapy, individual therapy. Uh, we try to utilize medications to help with the nightmares, uh, utilize medication to help with panic attacks, depression, anxiety. Uh, along with post-traumatic stress disorder comes a lot of substance abuse, dealing with those issues. Uh, all of that's in involved in treating the veteran here. One of the reasons that the Babylon Vet Center and all vet centers throughout the country are so effective is because 60% of the staff are veterans themselves. People coming from overseas now have to understand that Everybody is here to help you. We, the doctors and the staff at the PTSD clinic truly understand PTSD, and they go out of their way to give us skill, coping skills to help our family and loved ones. When I came back, um, I had done a couple of different jobs, but I was just really passionately thinking about those that were still serving in Iraq and Afghanistan at that time, and those that were coming home and struggling. Um, I ended up getting a job with a, uh, with a veterans organization, the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, and um, they had me sit down and start reading about PTSD, and I remember going through sort of a PTSD checklist, and that was when I started to see some of the symptoms that I was suffering from, and it was actually a huge relief to realize that that there were symptoms and that maybe I really was suffering from something and it wasn't just sort of my own discomfort or dissatisfaction with life after the military. When a veteran attends uh, therapy, the first step is often to, that's the biggest step, is acknowledgement that there is an issue, that there is a problem, and that's a big step. I had actually uh, decided to talk to a therapist. Um, I decided to talk to a social worker. Um, it seemed less scary to me than some of the other um, clinicians that are out there. But um, that was really where I began the journey towards healing. It was three years after I got back. I wish I had done it a little bit earlier. Well, by going through the PTSD residential program, which is a 90-day program, they have given me tools. Unfortunately, post-traumatic stress disorder is a disease. That, that disease will never go away. But they've given me tools 
to, to understand when I become depressed, when I become rageful, when I become judgmental, when I become suicidal, that I can call up people, that I can go to staff members and speak to them. There is a way out of this. There is a way. We would like to thank all the veterans who make sacrifices for our country. Our guests today have courageously shared their experiences with us, and it's commendable that they sought out the resources available to deal with PTSD. For more information about resources available on Long Island for veterans, please contact the Suffolk County Veterans Service Agency at area code 631-853-VETS. Up next, we have an interview with Colleen Merlot from the Mental Health Association of Suffolk. We'll be right back. They'll be fine, I hope. What if you could prevent a young person from getting hurt or killed? What should I do? If you could turn back the clock and stop an underage drinking party from ever happening, now you can. Pick up the phone and call 1-866-UNDER-21. It's your community, your call, and it's completely anonymous. Challenging the stigma associated with mental illness has been an ongoing campaign for the Mental Health Association of Suffolk. Starting this year, an entire week is being dedicated to that effort with various events and activities across Suffolk County. The director of the MHA, Colleen Merlot, joins us in the studio to discuss her organization's commitment to this effort. Colleen, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me today, Art. Great. I guess, I guess the first thing to talk about is the fact that over the years there had been one event in October. That's true. Um, Clubhouse of Suffolk for the past 20 years mm -hmm. has done a one-day conference where they brought in celebrity speakers um, who live with mental illness um, to raise awareness. Um, but this year what we realized was you know we really had been preaching to the choir with that one-day event and we wanted to make it more accessible to the general community to get involved in the week. Mm. And this of course is part of a larger national effort. That's right. In 1990 um, Congress declared Mental Illness Awareness Observance Week, uh, the first week in October, the first full week. So this, this year it's October 6th through the 12th, but it happens every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what gave you the idea of, of increasing? Now you mentioned that you knew that you wanted to involve more people, but how did you decide to approach the agencies and the various providers? What were your thoughts on that? Um, well, we wanted to get as many different um, community groups involved so that there would be something happening right. throughout Suffolk County. Um, but we also recognize that people can't really take on more. So what we did was, you know, something that you're already doing, something you're already planning, do it during that week. Um, do something small. Talk to staff about raising awareness or, um, you know, invite the community to come see your agency. And the sense I've gotten from talking to people is a lot of excitement about this. People really took that challenge and have really ran with it. Yeah, people are doing some really creative and exciting things that we really hadn't anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing some film screenings, we're having an art show, um, we're doing some other creative exploration um, journey things. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on. Fall festivals where families can come and, and get involved and you know, have fun but also learn about mental illness and you know, raise some awareness. Mm. And when we say raise awareness, what do we really mean? I know usually we talk about raising awareness and we talk about stigma. What does that mean to you? Yeah, well, you know, because of some of the tragic events that have taken place in our country, people have been talking about mental illness. But a lot of what they are saying is not based in fact. Um, you know, people in the general public are now believing that people with mental illness are violent. And you know, you and I know that that's yeah. not true. More likely to be victims. More likely to be victims. But people don't believe that because that's not what they're hearing. So this is a week where we can really, you know, dis dispel some of those myths and talk about the fact that you know, one in five people has mental illness. You probably work alongside someone who has a mental illness. You probably go to church with someone who has a mental illness. Um, so people with mental illness are all around us. You know leading lives, productive, sure. healthy, happy lives. And we just want to highlight that that's really the face of mental illness. Mm. And of course one of the ways you're doing that is really inviting programs. In one case, one of the, um, the films is going to be a challenge to bring somebody that's never been involved with any of this to kind of experience it. I love that challenge. Yeah. I think yeah. that's such a creative, wonderful idea. 
um, bring someone who you don't normally talk to about mental illness and have the conversation. Um, and that's something else that I've been asking people to do. You know, not everyone can host a big event, sure. but everyone can have a conversation with someone else. Talk about mental illness during that week. Start a conversation. And that's mm -hmm. how we really can change people's mindsets and deliver the message of, of hope and recovery, that that's possible for people. That's great. And, and have schools or libraries or anybody else gotten involved in this? Yeah, we have a lot of different community groups involved. We're mm -hmm. doing presentations in the library. Um, many libraries are also hosting, um, you know, their featured books that month will be around mental illness and recovery. Um, so we have gotten a lot of different community. Um, yeah. I'll be speaking to schools actually the week before and that week um, to students and to teachers about mental illness and the warning signs and what people can do to get help if they need it. That's great. And how many events are there at this point? Well, there's over 25 at last wow. count. <laughs> but we have been adding more. Mm -hmm. um, we do have an online calendar that people can visit to get more details and to find something local in their community that they may want to um, participate in. And that website is miaweek.org. Mm. How does this fit in overall to the MHA mission? I mean, it seems integral. It, it, it seems that this is exactly what the MHA is about. I mean, so much of what we do is really about educating the public and promoting mental illness awareness. So this really is key to our mission. Um, it ties in really well with you know, the overall mission for us to educate the community. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like when you first started thinking of this, when it was just a kernel of thought, you probably didn't imagine it would get this big, huh? Not the first year, yeah, you know. Yeah. I really, I didn't want to set my expectations too high, but I'm, I, they far exceeded what we really thought we could accomplish. Um, you know, the community of mental health providers have been so responsive and really mm -hmm. very energized. Um, you know, we have postcards that we put out, and I love, I walk into a place to put them down and they're already sitting there. Mm -hmm. So people are getting the word out, and you know, it, it's really a wonderful community effort this year. Okay, great. So again, what's that website? It's www.miaweek.org. That's great, and um, we certainly encourage people to look into that and, and check out one of these events because it could be catching a movie, it could be seeing consumers and hearing consumers talk about their recovery, um, family members talking about how it's affected them, and in general I think what's going to happen is as people go from place to place and just see, like you said, simply a book in a library, it's going to make them think, oh yeah, mental health, what do I know about mental illness? And it starts to get people thinking. That's really exciting. Yeah, that's our goal. Great. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Art. All right, great. We'd like to thank Colleen Merlot for sharing her expertise on this important topic, as well as continuing to raise awareness and challenge stigma regarding mental illness. Up next, we have an archive segment on the Response Hotline. Stay tuned. Are you feeling down or anxious? Perhaps you've suffered a loss recently, or you're involved in a difficult relationship. Maybe you need food, shelter, help with financial problems, or just someone to listen. Whatever your concern, you'll find a caring, accepting person when you call Response. Their volunteers will give you all the time and information you need, night or day. Call 751-7500. It's anonymous and confidential. Response is a crisis intervention and referral hotline available all year round, 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Response provides callers in Suffolk County with professionally trained and compassionate counselors who provide help and support to persons dealing with crisis. Response since 1971 has been a uh, crisis center in Suffolk County and beyond. Our core service is our hotline, which is available 24-7, 365 days a year. It's free. When, when you receive a call, it, uh, it, it could be ranged from anything from uh, financial problems to people who are lonely to people who are uh, thinking of committing suicide or know somebody that's thinking of committing suicide. Our core mission is to provide people going through any type of life crisis with that free, accessible, uh, caring, human response um, anytime they might need it. 
and that would include any kind of crisis up to a suicidal crisis. It is so very, very important that all of us are aware of the warning signs that people do exhibit when they're going through any depression or even thinking of suicide. Warning signs for depression and suicide fall into two major categories. There are warning signs that you see that you will hear. Somebody will say something. Um, it could either be a very direct um, thing that's, that you will hear. In other words, somebody will say to you, I don't want to live anymore. That's a very direct verbal warning sign. Or it could be more indirect. Somebody might say to you, I just can't take it anymore. Life is just too much. Or it could be behavioral. Warning signs could be behaviors that you observe. Uh, behaviors such as isolation, uh, reckless behavior, moodiness, constant crying, um, unable to function. Depression does affect uh, people not only uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically. It really affects every area of our life, our ability to function in school, at work. And, and behavioral warning signs can be direct or indirect as well. A very direct behavioral warning sign would be uh, me saying to you, uh, please take this prized possession of mine. I, I don't need it anymore. You're not, I'm not have, I won't have any use for it anymore. That, that could be a very direct warning sign or hoarding pills or researching things on the internet. Um, so warning signs fall into those categories. But understand too that suicide is a very complicated behavior. So you take the warning signs along with risk factors, what we would call risk factors, things that we know about this individual in terms of their family history or if they use drugs or alcohol or uh, if there's a mental illness. Um, so you take the risk factors along with the warning signs and they come together in just the wrong way at just the wrong time and we would call that the perfect storm. Right, so the, the, the purpose is really not to, um, to fix anything or anybody uh, and, and you couldn't do that on the phone not knowing them and not understanding the history so the, the purpose really becomes to help lower their anxiety level and help them through the crisis. The main goal of crisis counseling would be to lower anxiety so that people can get to a place where they can think through their own best next steps. And that is the main goal of crisis counseling. In addition to the hotline, we have an online crisis counseling program. We have a bilingual hotline. We are back up to probation for runaway and homeless youth. Um, and we have a very active community education program. Well, primarily, my responsibility is to um, educate and train and supervise some of the uh, educate all of the educators in the community for Response to Suffolk County. Um, and what she does is she coordinates all of our presentations in middle schools and high schools throughout Suffolk County. We get funding through the Youth Bureau with, to, um, with a special focus on adolescent suicide prevention. So we have educators that go out and um, uh, teach kids about active listening skills, how to help a friend, the warning signs of suicide and depression, and t telling kids about how to access our services. As a, as a training coordinator, what we're looking for in terms of our volunteers, um, we're looking for people who are willing to, to listen, to, who are open to learning a new way of communicating. We use a lot of active listening skills. Um, we're looking for people who are uh, open-minded, who are non-judgmental, um, and are willing to learn um, you know, a, a new set of skills. The training that's received here is, is in my opinion, is terrific training. They're very, very careful about how you do it, that you follow the rules, you do it the proper way, and, and there's constant training and constant supervision and so that you know that you're doing it the right way. We're also looking for people that are willing to make a commitment of at least six months. Um, and they only need to be 18 years or older. Um, they don't need to have any specific type of education um, or background to, to volunteer with us. So on a personal level, what I get out of being a crisis counselor is uh, the ability really to help people that are in need on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, that gives me just a lot of satisfaction of being able to do that. So when I started out as a volunteer here, uh, the thing that I remember being the most fulfilling initially was I felt like I was coming home. Um, it was a new place. I was new to the area and 
um, the, the other volunteers and the staff were so warm and welcoming. It was like this wonderful pocket of the nicest people in the world and I looked forward to going there every, every week. And I really enjoyed um, talking to the callers. Um, the, the, we have such a wide variety of callers. But I really felt like I was helping in a very direct way. Um, and, it, and it made me feel like I was contributing something and there was a real satisfaction, there was an immediate gratification um, in knowing that I, was, that I was making a connection with someone over the line and that I was making a difference right away. Uh, many people wonder how, how uh, people find response, um, and there are many different ways. Um, one way is through our community education program. We uh, reach thousands of Suffolk County youth in middle schools and high schools through our community education program. Um, we also do trainings um, two or three times a year at a local university. And in promoting those trainings, we reach out to local colleges, libraries, um, uh, we do public service announcements, we are in the yellow pages. Uh, and uh, finally, another way people find out about us is through the National Lifeline, which uh, is a toll-free number that you can see sometimes when you're driving on the New Jersey Turnpike. We're part of that network. Um, so there are many different ways people find out about us, but we're always looking to let the community know about us. We don't want to be the best kept secret in Suffolk County. We want people to know about us so that when they're in crisis, they know where to turn. We'd like to thank Response of Suffolk County for their tremendous work as a crisis intervention community resource. For more information about Response or to call for anonymous help and support, contact them at area code 631 751 7500 or log on to their website at www.responsehotline.org. We'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in to Something of Substance. Our video magazine is a public resource and we're eager to hear your feedback as well as any suggestions you may have for future show topics. Please send me an email at art.flesher at suffolkcountyny.gov. I'm your host, Art Flesher. Join us again next month for more of Something of Substance.